Hey, hey everybody, it's Kick Scammer time. The show where I DJ Slope with the help of my Kick Scammer detective agency on Discord. Look for the absolute worst Kickstarters, the scammiest Indiegogos, and the most dreadful GoFundMes to ever exist. And with almost 100 videos on this very topic, today on the show I plan to pull together yet another five examples that still to this day never fail to shock me. Remember those late night shopping channel adverts trying to sell you stupid gadgets that you're never going to be seeing in the shops? Yeah? Well, if you're like me, you can't help but stop and stare at the absolute tosh that these guys were trying to palm off. And sure, even though these channels do still exist, they are a lot more few and far between these days. However, thankfully we have now got crowdfunding in their place and today on the show I plan to look back at the top 5 absolute worst gadgets on the show in this Kickstarter's Terrible Gadgets. Welcome to Slope's Game Room. But before going ahead, a quick word from this video's sponsor. NordVPN, a service that they offered me and I turned it down. Why? Because I'm already using it. It's a service I've been using for many, many years, not only to keep myself protected from the outside world, but also to get around location-restricted news sites that sometimes are so specific and niche, I would have absolutely no way of creating videos like these without a service like NordVPN. And guys, that's the honest truth. Plus, it is pretty awesome to be able to go about your day and not have to worry about what your ISP provider's looking at, you know, or even dodgier people than that. As a dad, security is everything for me, and if this sounds appealing to you, do what I did. I signed up using a link in the channel that I wanted to support, and if you want to help Slope's Game Room out, then you know, let's work together by going to my specific link below using the coupon code SLOPE. And by doing so, not only do you support the show, but you are also getting an awesome service with some rather awesome savings if you use the link below and go for the two-year plan. It's what I chose and still use it frequently in order to get access to shows that you Americans get before us, such as the movie Nobody, which is currently available to rent in America but still doesn't even have a release date here in the UK, and the entire Stars catalogue that is available to us UK residents but isn't available to the Americans. It's simple. Go to the link, use the code SLOPE, get it cheap, and thank me later. Anyway, let's carry on with the show. No, not that Triton. This Triton. Which I suppose would actually help in meeting up with this Triton, as you can spend the rest of your life under the sea. Probably the coolest sounding item on this whole list, Triton, the first rebreather with artificial gill. It's simply a device that you slot in your gob, and with its earth shattering technology, can actually extract the oxygen from the surrounding water directly to you, meaning that you can breathe underwater. Wow, this is like something out of a James Bond movie. Well, as you would expect, these are the claims made in the horribly audio mixed campaign video, and obviously the whole thing is completely bogus. Why? Because there simply is not enough oxygen in the surrounding water of these artificial gills for them to work. Meaning that if it did in fact let you breathe underwater, then it would need to include a mini gas cylinder, making it no different than your standard scuba diving gear. Well, Apart from the fact that it will no doubt last all of about 5 minutes, and as the well tried to warn the casual consumer that these claims are completely false, and that the whole thing was probably a scam, all they did was gain interest in the campaign. So, how much money did they get? Well, it's actually quite hard to say, because Indiegogo took it down. But from what I can tell of that $50,000 goal, at least, 2,362 backers got up to at least $865,269. But yeah, like I said, Indiegogo took it down with 24 days to go. 
after the company finally admitted that it wasn't simply filters separating the oxygen from the water. Since launching, we have been protecting our proprietary technology because it's so important to our success. But after careful consideration, we think it's important to share these details and clarify how the device works. Inside of each Triton, the artificial gills utilize liquid oxygen, which combined with the other components, allow users to breathe underwater, which you can see in the video above. We will release more information about the liquid oxygen cylinders and safety strap. Note that the liquid oxygen cylinders won't last forever, so we plan to make it possible for backers to purchase and exchange cylinders through our website. They will come in packs of 1, 3 and 5, and we will list prices as soon as they are finalized. We're also working on a solution to make them refillable. Ah, would you look at that. By this point, money had already been taken from plenty of the backers. And in a very rare instance, in fact the only instance to date on Kick Scammers, the company actually refunded the backers. Mostly. Yes, some did in fact get a refund, but considering there was no normal update anywhere to be seen on the campaign, which has now mysteriously vanished, might I add, if you didn't know about that refund at the time, you missed your chance, resulting in this yet again being another scam. But a scam that has given off the impression of doing the right thing, even though the whole thing was one massive lie from the very beginning. Hey, Make a decent enough looking video and people will buy into anything, am I right? And finally, props to another campaign called Triton World's Last Artificial Gill Scam that was created so it would show up when people searched for the original campaign and was basically used to simply warn people not to back the project. This is Jeff, and this is his exercise routine. He works hard to build up his cardio and muscle. He also wants to lose weight, but it takes time and energy to burn away the pounds. Jeff would stay in the gym and continue to fight for weight loss results, but he needs to get to work. If only he could take the gym with him. This is Jessica, and she's discovered an innovative new way to bring her weight loss regime into the office. She'll continue to lose weight all day because of a revolutionary technology that's hidden comfortably in her shoes. So yeah, this is it. Thin ice is a pair of insoles that keeps you cold so that your body is forced to work overtime to keep you warm. I mean, technically, it's not the worst idea. I mean, honestly, I don't actually know if it's going to work, but I suppose the idea isn't completely stupid, right? Put them in your shoes and walk around losing weight as you go about your normal daily task. Sadly, the campaign didn't hit its target of only $50,000 as it only got $16,710. But as usual, it was a flexible goal and he was still able to take that funding home. But what does this actually mean? Well, thankfully, Adam Paulin, the campaign's owner, doesn't think it matters at all. And days before the campaign ended, he posted an update saying... Just to answer a common question, you will still receive your Thin Ice products in line with our deadline if you purchase now. Thank you for your support. And then, just a few days later... As of 2.30pm EST on July 28th, we will have launched a new Indiegogo campaign. If you missed out on the first chance, go grab your Thin Ice Tech. Please find the new campaign here. Bloody hell, if you don't succeed, try, try again, right? That's exactly what Adam Paulin did. But this time, he hit it a lot harder. This sort of update went on and on and Adam was finally able to smash his goal when he got it to a staggering $592,551, which totals $612,261 for those that didn't fancy the test. <laughs> Not a bad amount, right? Well, it doesn't end there. Introducing campaign number three, Thin Ice 2.0. <laughs> Again, some introduction, but slightly different midsections in the video. 
This time, he managed to pull in a further $368,369, bringing his new total to $980,630. And this one was actually funded over on Kickstarter, but for whatever reason was actually linked back to another Indiegogo campaign, which makes the whole research on this one a little harder to do. Look guys, I'm just going to speed it up. Here's another campaign by the same guy for essentially the same product. And another, and another, and another, and another, and another, and another, and another. Now, obviously he didn't hit target on all of these campaigns and the exact figure is a little confusing when you start trying to piece all of this together. But by my estimation, the guy got close to $1,100,000. But considering he didn't hit target on all of the campaigns and obviously fees needed to be paid to marketing companies and Kickstarter and Indiegogo, that figure is actually a lot closer to £700,000. But regardless, it is still a tremendous amount of money and obviously 14 campaigns equaled thousands upon thousands of backers all after slightly different variations of the same product but still that wasn't enough here he is again on Dragon's Den, the Canadian edition. He asked for another $50,000 and he walked away with nothing. The only positive was that it might work for a small number of people on a site like Kickstarter rather than the whole thing. Yeah, look, I, I actually think that you might, this is a gimmick that might work because it's, <laughs> it actually, it might work to sell like 10,000 units on Kickstarter. I just don't think it has longevity here for a long then. time. Yeah. I don't really know about about the science behind it, so it's the nice to me. I'm out. <laughs> yes, I gotta say that made me very, very happy. So where are we now? Well, although this isn't the end, I mean, come on, the guy is likely going to be starting up another 14 campaigns at some point. In his defense, he does, or at least has a group of people, replying to almost every single response on all of these crowdfunding websites. The only problem is, almost nobody has received their products, and the ones that have look nothing like what they were shown in the previews and the whole I sold trainer thing. Well, we never even heard of that campaign again. This is, without a doubt, a failure in every sense of the word. The guy has now thousands upon thousands upon thousands of backers to please, like I said, all of which want slightly different variations of the same product. And when you look at it like that, $700,000 doesn't seem that much, does it? And the proof of all of this was most definitely in the pudding. Oh, um, yeah, no offense, guys, no offense. When you back a Kickstarter, what are you actually doing? Are you backing an idea? Are you part of a team? Or are you literally purchasing goods? Sadly, everyone has a different opinion, and although the truth really is that you are indeed putting your money into an individual and hoping that that person or persons can actually fulfill on their promises, when you actually look at these crowdfunding websites, you wouldn't be foolish in thinking that they're nothing more than catalogues full of cool crap that you don't normally see in the shops. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is U-Brew, the ultimate beverage bar. It's easily one of the more interesting devices that I honestly would love to have in my studio for whenever I have my next WarioWare smooth move drinking night. It's essentially a mini bar for your house. It stores your drinks, keeps them cool, and it even lets you mix in other flavors so that you can get ready and have a fight after you've had a few pints of snake bite. And if you don't know what snake bite is, well, you're the lucky one. So yeah, honestly, this one does look fine. You know, the LCD screen is just a simple sticker, as you can see on certain shots of this trailer. And really, guys, that's the problem. It's a prototype. What you believe that you're seeing here doesn't actually exist. Even though the campaign needed 39,000, it easily hit that when 178 backers got it all the way up to a mouth-watering $64,898 again for a prototype. 
And this is my biggest problem with crowdfunding websites, that they are in fact a little bit deceiving. You think you're buying this, something that looks like the final product, but actually you're investing in this guy, George Bruton, whose previous company, if you didn't know, School Live, provides what are essentially massive screens that kids can interact with in schools on their phones. They not only double as an important message board, but also an advertising board selling, well, whatever advertisers want to put on there. Plus, this information on the students did get fed back to the military for, you know, even more tailored ads. The whole idea didn't exactly go down too well, as the report suggested that taxpayers' money, which was being spent on kids spending time in school, really should never be sold to advertisers. And regardless of whatever you think, it does paint a picture into the person that you would be investing in when you try and get your carbonated beverages on tap in your house. Which is why, for me, it came as no surprise when I found out that the whole company eventually ended up being sold, or at least was in talks of being sold, to an unknown buyer. What the hell happened to the $65,000 raised on this campaign? I don't know. That's the new buyer's problem to deal with, not George's. The whole thing was painted up as a way to get the product into more consumers' hands and even add a few extra features. But, you know, let's be honest, $65,000 raised on a campaign and a buyout of a buzzing new company does sound pretty appealing for George. Did this sale ever go through? Probably not. As of November 16th, 2017, the very latest update, it reads that due to a pending sale, the engineer who designed the Ubru has held the design hostage and demanded much more money than we were contracted for, which he was paid in full. To me, this is a perfect example of making sure you do your homework on the sort of person that you're backing because this is literally the greedy trying to outsmart the greedy and nothing more. There's nothing that ever got finished here and all you have are hundreds of angry backers who are begging for a response or an update on a product that are most definitely never going to receive it. Ladies and gentlemen, do your homework. None of us like passwords, they're bloody annoying. Having to change your once simple password to at least 8 characters long to then include a number and of course that all important special character, that is before you have to redo it all several weeks later. It's a pain in the bloody ass having to confirm your email link on your phone all just so you can forget it 5 times in a row to get locked out of whatever site you're surfing. Yep. This is all common knowledge, and let's be honest, one of the biggest first world problems out there. Well, with every problem that needs solving, a whole heap of inventors come to the rescue to save the day by starting up Kickstarters to remedy the issue. In fact, if you simply type the word password into Kickstarter, you get 83 results. 83 examples of projects with varying levels of success aiming to help take the stress out of password memorization. There's successful projects like the Enigmaze, which is essentially a small book of jumbled up letters so you can create your own random assortment to block your trusted websites. Let's just hope you don't ever lose that book. Or if that seems like too much work for you, why not go see this guy who will create passwords for you using a system called Diceware, where you'll roll dice several times to give you a combination of results, making your password mostly unique. But why should you spend money on a Diceware password instead of, you know, just making one yourself? You can definitely make one for yourself. I started this business because my mom was too lazy to roll dice so many times, so she paid me to roll dice and make passwords for her. Then I realised that other people wanted them too. Selling passwords to your mum? Come on, mate. So go on then, how many people are actually interested in this? Ah. Right, let's get to the main Kickstarter, shall we? Introducing My ID Key, a small USB device with a fingerprint reader and voice recognizing software that, when plugged into your PC, auto fills in password boxes with the relevant information. 
It did insanely well during its Kickstarter campaign, pulling in $473,333 of a $150,000 campaign from 3,927 backers. But, just like most innovative startup companies with a new idea like this, Kickstarter wasn't the final figure. Because after winning several awards at the 2013 Consumer Electronics Show, it impressed so much that it was able to pull in a further $3 million in startup capital from investors in the project. <laughs> wow, not bad guys. Now, one of Kickstarter's rules when launching a campaign like this is that the creator must have a functional prototype. And these guys had exactly that. Hence why they got so much from investors too. In fact, according to Arkami Inc., you know, the company creating the product, the only real issue is the components inside, which they hinted could cause delays, and as long-time watchers of this show will know, delays are really not a big deal in my eyes. Unless, of course, you're John K. Oh, don't you worry, sunshine. You will get your time in the Kickstarter spotlight soon enough. So, with everything going so well for the company, what went wrong? Well, it was all due to this guy, one Benjamin Chen, the CEO. It was agreed that Benjamin here was able to take a more hands-on day-to-day approach in the development of the product. And although a prototype was made way back when, it was decided that with all of this extra cash that they would redesign it over and over and over and over again. This was the final product, and with so many additional features added, upgraded hardware, upgraded firmware, and constantly changing of suppliers, what you have is an arguably slicker looking product, but a product that was incredibly buggy, and in most cases, it just simply didn't work. The vast majority of this investigation was taken from the site Ars Technica, so big shout out to them. The article goes into detail about how very few people received the product with practically everyone being unhappy with it, the company obviously running out of money which resulted in Benji sacking the entire company including himself whilst he looked for investors to pick it all back up again. And according to Benji boy, the company is not dead yet but in deep hibernation. Do you know what the percentage of completion is for Kickstarters in general for technology based startups? Probably 85% of all startups fail. So, what's left? Well, you know, all the usual. A Kickstarter with no updates since October 2015, a Kickstarter that hasn't been looked at since February 2017, and of course, a Kickstarter that is full of commenters constantly repeating I hereby invoke my rights under Kickstarter's terms of use. HTTPS colon slash slash Guys, 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 what are you doing? Why are you even bothering? Just successful fundraising campaigns or refund any backer whose refund they do not or cannot fulfill. I demand a full refund for my pledge amount. Anybody out there that has tried a dual screen setup will tell you that once you've used it, you can never go back. However, from time to time, you've simply got no choice. Your phone is single screen, your tablet, and most notably, your laptop. We tried to make do, but there really isn't much we can do as turning a handheld device into a dual screen setup will make it too big and clunky, and doing the same with a laptop or tablet is both fat and ugly, but also takes way too much processing power shooting up the cost. But with all that said, we perhaps kind of do want it to happen and there have been plenty of attempts at making it work with the most common being the inclusion of a tablet or phone plugged in and then bolted onto the side. I suppose you could say that we want all of these devices pushed together into one cool unique device. Wouldn't that be fantastic? Well, thankfully we have Jeff Batio here to save the day. But who is Jeff? 
Well, back in the early 2000s, Jeff Batio, the inventor, founder and CEO of Zentex Technologies, created this, the Flip Pad Voyager. Released in, well, pretty much zero quantities back in 2002, we'll get to why in a minute, this sexy for the time looking system had a massive price tag of $4,995, it had a 20 inch screen which is obviously cut in half, it includes 4 USBs, an Ethernet port, Firewire, 2 PCMCIA slots and a modem among other things. Yes, 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 it's all very impressive although completely out of anybody's price range. This little device, which is so rare that there isn't even one video on YouTube about it at all, was indeed the seeds of Mr. Batio's eventual crowdfunding project. During the run-up to its release, Jeff did quite a few interviews promoting it, so you can find loads of information about the 850MHz Athlon processor, its 128MB of RAM and its floppy drive. You just can't find anybody that actually owns one, except for one, weirdly enough, that did get sold on eBay back in 2008 with a starting bid of $99. No idea who it went to or how much for, mind you. As stated, this impressive looking machine was never released and according to Jeff himself, that was due to the betrayal of a few different shareholders and the company's manufacturer. But that's not 100% true, is it, Jeff? You see, as this video goes on, you will discover just how much of a scumbagian Jeff was, eventually screwing over his future backers of the eventual Indiegogo campaign, which we will get to, as that was when the entire subreddits were formed to take down this individual, and a crazy amount of background checking on this guy was done, and yes, we have in fact got a little ahead of ourselves, but still... It was in this subreddit that we found the real reason that the Zentex Voyager wasn't released all of those years ago. Basically, Jeff held a meeting on November the 1st, 2000, and at this meeting he showcased the Voyager to potential investors hoping that they would buy stocks in Zentex. $3.3 million was the eventual sum that they got, and they got this by making, according to court documents, oral misrepresentations stating that... All necessary production arrangements were ready for mass production, that the company that was mass producing it had completed the tooling required for mass production, everything needed to make the device was already done and all money invested would just go on marketing and that the device presented was made by the manufacturers. All of which was obviously lies and fully goes against Jeff's own version of events found on the Zentex.com's website. And yes, he does indeed forget to bring up the fact that he was taking out loans from these investors' marketing money for his own personal use, to pay for things such as past due deals, his own personal living expenses, card payments, and of course, the odd vacation too. So yes, it all gives a very good indication into the sort of person that we're dealing with here, doesn't it? Jeff Batio, the dynamic futurist. This is a term I coined myself to represent somebody who doesn't see the future based on studying the trends being created by others, but instead is someone who helps to create the future by dynamically acting to create and make a better world for us all. Think of Thomas Edison, Henry Ford, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs to name but a few. <laughs> yes. Jeff thinks quite a bit of himself, doesn't he? Which is why, as soon as Zentex went down the drain, another company emerged. Introducing company number two, called Armada Systems LLC. And Jeff did what he did best and created another product that I believe is related to this patent. Yep, very similar to what we had before, and over the next four years he got himself another 75 investors to drop another $500,000. <sighs> Again, Armada Systems produced nothing, and this time, enough was enough. Again, via the Wayback Machine, we can actually see an order of probation from the Secretary of State in Illinois that reads... It is hereby ordered that, pursuant to the authority granted by Section 11F of the Act, Respondents Jeffrey A. Badio and Armada Systems LLC and their partners, officers and directors, agents, employees, affiliates, successors and assigns are prohibited from offering or selling securities in or from this state until the further order of the Secretary of State. 
It all sounds bad, doesn't it? And for those that don't understand, it basically means that Jeff is quite literally banned from selling securities, as he calls it, which is just a fancy term for shares, within the state of Illinois. No more stealing from local investors, right? Surely the sum of around $4 million is enough. He quite literally can't get away with this anymore. Jeff has now got two failed companies under his belt. He has local investors not wanting to do anything with him and because of that order of probation, he couldn't work with them even if he wanted to. This is quite literally the situation that Jeff found himself in. It begs the question, where else is there to go for someone like Jeff? Hmm. <laughs> yes, yeah, screw the state. That small time back in 2014, websites like Indiegogo and Kickstarter were huge. Some of the site's biggest projects came from around that year and backers were in full force, myself included. And as his next attempt at a dual screen laptop hadn't actually been made yet, he decided to steer clear of Kickstarter and instead go over to Indiegogo where, you know, it doesn't matter if you have a prototype or not. Introducing the Dragonfly. By folding and transforming, Dragonfly provides the devices you already use in an elegant new form, creating one device out of three to truly simplify your life. With its dual displays, everything from working, playing, and communicating becomes a breeze. Dragonfly's versatility makes having to buy multiple devices, accessories, and data plans a thing of the past. Welcome to the future. So whilst these sexy animations show up in the campaign's video, I think it's worth talking about the ups and downs from Jeff's side by doing something like this. The upside to doing a campaign is obviously less people knowing what you're talking about and you get loads of investors rather quickly, which is exactly what happened. But the downside is quite the opposite. For every backer that knew no better, there was an onlooker thinking to themselves, wait, this can't be right. We obviously all know that nothing came from this in the end, but put yourself in the mindset of a 2014 onlooker. This i7 laptop with two screens, eight gigabytes of RAM and a minimum eight hour battery life with a detachable Android phone offering three gigabytes of RAM, wireless charging, a Snapdragon 801 processor, smart pen and <laughs> four cameras was only 658 quid or $800. Even by today's standards, for something like this, that's pretty cheap. But back then, especially, it just seemed stupid. Something that's only slightly bigger than a dime included all of these features and weighed less than half the weight of a current i7 for the time. The goal was only $10,000, which I'm sure we can all agree was a pretty easy target to hit for a product that was obviously going to be this impressive. Yes, it's obvious that this magic machine was either going to be nothing like the render show or simply it just wasn't going to get released. Which, well, spoiler alert, it didn't. But, would you believe it? We have in fact got a little ahead of ourselves once again. Because would you look at this? <laughs> Two campaigns. Yep, the campaign I just showed you was indeed the second dual screen laptop campaign they'd ever done. And nope, they never went anywhere with the first one either, even though that too did hit target. And as stated earlier, Kickscammer fans, this was when the internet blew up and those subreddits entirely dedicated to the campaign started to emerge. Now, even though obviously nothing much of anything was done behind the scenes, the updates did actually surprisingly come fairly frequently. And it was here that the backers and subreddits had the most amount of fun pulling apart the endless amounts of excuses and 3D renders that Jeff and his new co-host, Bridget Hogan, were showcasing in every every single post. Here's a few of my favorite future phone subreddit findings. There's that time that they were caught literally just ripping off somebody else's design, including mock-up designs that were also called the Dragonfly several years earlier. There was the rebate scheme pushed later in the campaign's life that would apparently give backers 99% of their money back on top of receiving the device. There was the time that Redditors actually found the duo's registry, proving that they're not just a couple of work colleagues, but instead in a very serious Bonnie and Clyde-like relationship, which they actually tried to hide from backers 
backers by deleting said registry. But best of all was the update video that finally showcased the prototype. What's wrong with it? <laughs> well it's fake. The device is fake, the reactions are obviously fake, but best of all is that this whole video was fake as it was actually filmed two years prior and when the awesome people over on reddit discovered this due to the emails shown within the video, Jeff himself replied saying that the image was royalty free and used for marketing purposes only, even given a link as to where he got it. Problem was, well one it wasn't royalty free as seen by the watermark and was actually an android screen grab of a blackberry device, something this system was simply not. He then backtracked and changed the upload video to a different screen grab. But does this mean that this is a new video of a new prototype? No. And guys, this really is where the future phone subreddit shines, <laughs> check this out. As seen here, it seems that Bridget is in a coffee shop. Thankfully, user Hex4Def6 recognised that coffee shop and gave examples of this and the pizza place that she was in too. Jingles Bo Bingles, who originally posted the claim, obviously got knocked down when Jeff claimed that the image was just simply from Google, you know, which it was. But that didn't stop him as further investigation showed a chalkboard in the background at the pizza restaurant and when looking painstakingly through old posts of that pizza restaurant's own Facebook page, he did indeed link the chalkboard to a post made exactly two years prior proving once and for all that this was indeed an old video. Come on, that deserves a round of applause all round. I do love the internet sometimes. <laughs> Basically nothing was working here. This shows nothing besides a slick looking 3D printed model. This video and all the other updates again show absolutely nothing. All this information was created at the very beginning of the campaign's life and then slowly drip fed to backers throughout the campaign's life to give the impression that stuff was getting done when it obviously wasn't. Why? Because all of this was going on whilst the duo was continuing to earn money via Indiegogo's in demand service which basically leaves donations open after a campaign ends. And on top of this, whilst very solid accusations were being made that Jeff and Bridget simply couldn't answer, Indiegogo was ignoring the complaints and still promoting the campaign via its own social media. Concerned onlookers constantly put down a dollar or two to join the campaign just so they could warn backers. However, Jeff and Bridget clocked onto this rather quickly and refunded the majority of small backers pledges and deleted their comments in an attempt to make the campaign look as clean and crisp as possible. What this basically did was pump up the average amount spent by most backers until the majority of the ones that were left were the ones that purchased the unit itself, which as stated was £657 or $800. Which is for each individual backer on this campaign a darn sight lot more than the majority majority of campaigns that I've shown on this channel in the past. Now shortly after this fiasco, a month or so later the duo put on one last post and then pretty much disappeared. Just like Jeff's two previous companies, his new business license then expired, meaning he couldn't even trade even if he did have the crap tops. The campaign was closed and that was the end of the magical dragonfly future phone. But it wasn't the end for Jeff as he found himself in court over this and even though several court dates got pushed back, the angriest of backers clubbed together as part of a victim list and he was finally found guilty of all 12 charges of fraud against him with each one holding a maximum sentence of 20 years in prison. His sentencing is now to be held on September 3rd of this very year. So guys, please do make sure you subscribe to find out what this huge scammer's outcome will be in a future episode of Kick Scammer News. And that very thing happened only last week. Yes, hello guys, this is DJ Slope from Slope's Game Room and thank you for checking out the video. Yes, so last week I recorded an episode of Kick Scammer News live over on Twitch and we discussed the latest updates on that segment you just watched. So I actually uploaded that video two years ago, so you're talking in 2019, and by that point it was already about a year old anyway. So from this point on in 
2021, July of 2021. Uh, it's already three years ago since he went to sentence, which got pushed back and pushed back. And now the latest update is that that sentencing has yet again been pushed back 11 times. Now, the theory to all of this is uh, he's already technically serving his sentence, waiting to go to trial to find out um, you know, how long that sentence will be. And as of right now, he's served three years of it. Um, and if that is true, that is insane. He's uh, getting away with it, guys. He's getting away with it. The latest update is the fact that the uh, new trial date will be the 28th of July, so in less than a week's time. And uh, yeah, we'll see if that actually happens. My guess is somehow he will be able to push it back once again but yeah, there you go anyway thank you all so so much for your support guys really really appreciate it this is the part of the video where i like to give a massive shout out to all of my patreons and youtube members that allow me to create videos like this like i always do on the channel so thank you all so so much with an extra big shout out going to uh, Aaron Gorman, Argo Craig, Andrew Dalton, Arista, uh, Benjamin Guy, Big Rico, Bram Perez, Brandon Gold, Cheshire One, Chris the Shapeshifter, Christopher DeVero, Clan Bob, Conrad Constantine, De Action Saxon, uh, Dalton, Daniel Tavares, Daniel Watson, Dina, Dina81, Doug B, Game Apologist, Gary Pingit, Harvey2478, Hmm. Intrigued Gaming, Jay's Manchild, Jabba Al Aiden, Jacob P, aka Avalon James, James, Jeff Mianowski, Jeremy Rodriguez, Joff Gibbon, Josh Gibbons, King Link Reviews, Lucas Gates, Lucas Softel, Man of God 9000, Man Shovel, Michael Ridley Dash, Mike Fallon, Mind of the Unsane, Nerdy Simmer Tatty. Nicholas Burtner, Nick Pollard, Nightwheel, Pretendo64, Roll VP, Retro to Next Gen, aka Lou, Richard Aldergic, Rocket Plod, Roven Army, Ryan Holt, Samuel Nilsson, Shade Silence, Shadow Dragon, Solix Captor, Steven, Taylor Rainwater, That Gamer, The Cunning Linguist, Tim Labonte, Tim Lunn, uh, Todd Paul Float G, Trans Rights, Vike Echo, Wobbles and Bean, The Wonder Ducks, and Ye Old Ham Burglar. If you guys want to be checking out all of the exclusive King Scammer episodes, as well as seeing videos early and you get to see what I'm working on, exclusive rooms in my Discord, all of that awesome stuff, then you can do that very thing. You can be a part of these awesome names that you're seeing right at the bottom of the screen right here. You can do that for as little as you wish by going over to Patreon or signing up as a YouTube member. There'll be links down below and you can see what perks are available at whatever tier. Thank you so, so much, guys, for all your support. This is DJ Slope signing out and hopefully I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.